Splatoon 3 is my most played game on the Switch. From that, you could probably guess that I love this game. And yeah, I do. It's easily the most fun I've had with an online shooter since, like, Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2. But... And this is a big but. I am very worried about the state this game is in, and I really need to get my thoughts out in a manner that doesn't rely on Twitter whining, so there's even the slightest chance it'll be addressed. And I'm not alone in most of these complaints, because a large portion of the player base shares the same problems. But before we get into my issues with this game, at least within its first year as of writing this, I think I should remind myself why I even like this game to begin with, as much as the devs don't want me to. If there's one thing Splatoon always nails, it's the core mechanics. The movement and the shooting feels so fluid and fun, and they complement each other beautifully. 1 and 2 already had great movement, but 3 ups the ante with squid rolling and surging, allowing for even more complex movement options. Actually, that would be the case if the map design was good, but we'll get to that later. The presentation is also on point. The gritty aesthetics and rockin' soundtrack make me really glad Team Chaos won. The special weapon design is easily the best in the series. Compared to nearly everything being busted in 1, one and whatever the f*** went on in 2. Nearly all the specials in 3 feel useful and easy to fight, and they can easily be rebalanced if they're too strong or weak. I'd argue that there's only one badly designed special in the game, that being the Tena Missiles, which are a returning special from 2. Moving on from general stuff, the story mode is great. It's easily the best non-DLC single-player campaign in the series, thanks to its fun exploration, inventive level design, quirky writing, trippy presentation, and deep lore that makes you rethink the entire series. The new idol group, Deep Cut, is great, especially Fry. She She's f***ing adorable. And last but not least, Salmon Run is thriving. I thought it was fine, I guess, back when it debuted in 2, but it wasn't exactly anything groundbreaking. In 3, however, it's godlike. The new stages, movement text, greater challenge, and egg throwing make this mode a blast. There we go, I've officially justified why I still like this game. Now it's time to go over why it's hard to like this game. <laughs> Nintendo Switch Online is garbage. <laughs> Pretty much every Switch owner and their mother agrees on that. Anyway, I'm not a tech genius by any means, but... It's 2023. An online shooter should not have lag and disconnection issues like this anymore. Not only is it annoying, but it can also cause people to lose matches through no fault of their own. On that topic, if you get disconnected in the middle of a match, you get granted a loss. Why? I understand that this is meant to scare players from force disconnecting themselves, but do you really think it's fair to punish players for something at fault of the devs? What's more is that the other players on a disconnector's team who stayed till the end of the match aren't granted a loss out of pity even though the actual disconnector was. Nintendo if you're not going to fix the netcode, could you at least make it so disconnecting in the middle of a match no longer grants you a loss? I mean, you could still make it so forced disconnections are still punishable with losses. If you got Tears of the Kingdom running on outdated hardware, surely you could handle that. Also, please improve the matchmaking. I'm sick of getting paired up with putzes and going up against pro charas. You could at least have us only be able to join up with people in our rank and raise the barrier for X battles. <laughs> There's a good chance you've noticed a recurring theme with all the new modes, aside from the story mode and the table turf minigame. What do tricolor turf war, big run, extra work, and challenges have in common? They're all only available for a limited time. Tricolor, I can get behind. It's the big appeal of this game's Splatfest, like how the shifty stations were back in 2. Big run, I can also understand. It's basically the salmon run equivalent to Splatfest. But extra work and challenges are where I draw the line. I'm not exactly fond of extra work, and I know salmon run itself was only sometimes available available back in 2, but this is Salmon Run's first proper secondary mode, and there's no reason for it to happen about as often as a Splatfest. It can't be that hard to churn out a fixed 5-wave shift. Even if extra work only happened weekly, I'd still tolerate it. Even more egregious is the challenge mode. Everyone went nuts over it when it was first revealed in the Sizzle Season trailer, only for all the hype to die as soon as we saw the strict time windows. Each challenge has three 2-hour windows, so if you forget about the challenges or can't make it, too bad. Why would you introduce a brilliant new mode full of potential only to make it barely playable. Is there any reason they're only available for six split up hours? Do you really expect people to wake up in the middle of the night just so they could jump a little higher? Come on, I thought we were over unnecessary time limits after Salmon Run became open all the time. If you're gonna lock all the new modes behind strict time limits, why even make a brand new game to begin with? 
I know I praised this game's special design earlier in the video, and I still stand by what I said about that. Unfortunately, I have a few issues with how they're distributed, leading me into the kit design and balancing. Now let's skim through a few problems I have. Why are the weaker specials like Reef Slider and Inkback not getting any significant buffs? Why is the only new subweapon line marker so pathetically weak? Why are the subweapons in general still really unbalanced? Why are most of the weapons to get second kits so far shooters? Why did the new season give most of its few kits utility subs only for the devs to not buff any of them? Why have the non-shooters gotten barely any bombs? Why did a few weapons get Salmon Run exclusive buffs that they really need in PvP? Why did they make Neo Splash a clone of T-Tech when Zipcaster would have been perfect for it? Why did it take 9 months for any of the new weapons to get new kits? Why have we not gotten a single new stringer? And for the love of god, why are missiles back? I'll still take it over Stingrays and Ink Armor, but there's still a lot to criticize about 3's balancing. I would say more, but I'll save it for later, as I must first bring up a different, much bigger problem with this game. At last, we have arrived at the map design. The one problem with this game no one will shut up about and for good reason. Honestly, if you ask me, the map design of Splatoon 3 is what really holds the game back from reaching its full potential. I'm not even a Splatoon 1 veteran, I got into the series midway into 2's life, and 2 wasn't exactly the peak of map design either, so when a 2 newbie is noticing problems, the problems must be really big. There have already been many videos critiquing the map design, and I personally recommend the ones by Prochara and Toyoben, as I feel like they do the best job at breaking the problems down. To sum things up, they're flat, cramped, narrow, repetitive, and linear. They seem to encourage head-on encounters, but they end up making backline weapons extremely oppressive and just generally replacing strategy with mindless stalling. Since routes are minimal and linear, it's very predictable where enemies come from. They have no defining features, and they don't even take advantage of their themes or even the game's mechanics at all. And in general, they're just really forgettable. When the next game comes around, I don't imagine anyone missing these maps. Unless the fourth game's maps are somehow even worse, which is kinda likely knowing the devs, it especially sucks that the layout for Scorch Gorge and Eeltail Alley shown in early trailers look so much more fun than what we got in the final game, and that the three current post-launch maps all share the same base layout. Seriously, look at all the unused space in Umami Ruins and Barnacle and Dime that could have been used for flank routes. I know what you're thinking. Good point, except not at all, because they're not off the hook either. For whatever arbitrary reason, they made some Star Wars Special Edition-ass changes to the returning maps from Splatoon 1. Flounder Heights and Museum del Fonsino are thankfully mostly intact, and still solid maps, but Hammerhead Bridge and Mahi Mahi Resort were not so lucky. Hammerhead retains not even a single aspect of its Splatoon 1 original. It is now a straight line with no alternate routes, completely throwing any semblance of thought into the bay. It is pure brute force over strategy, but it at least has the excuse of continuity, which I cannot say for Mahi Mahi. I personally don't find new Mahi as bad as new Hammerhead, but it is definitely more baffling and insulting. What was once one of the most beloved maps in Splatoon Splatoon 1 is now the punching bag of Splatoon 3's maps. It's been shrunk down and gutted of all its flank routes. It's so small, in fact, that the stage has a completely different layout for each ranked mode, which wouldn't have been an issue if they just kept the old layout. In fact, it probably would have taken less effort to just port the original map over from Splatoon 1, but no! They had to put in the extra effort to rebuild it from the ground up and ruin it in the process. It sucks to see beloved maps get treated like this when the returning maps from 2 are unchanged, including Wahoo! world, one of the most despised maps in the series. How come the story mode and salmon run get all the good map design while the PvP, the main part of the game, is given nothing but hallways? The map design makes matches feel claustrophobic and repetitive, which can drive and has driven people away from the game despite how good the movement, specials, and other aspects are. Of course, the devs can still fix this, right? Well, about that. The update cycle has been redone since 1 and 2. In those games, updates were significantly smaller, but they happened pretty much weekly. This provided lots of opportunities for new content, and an incentive to tune in as much as possible. Content updates in 3 add a lot more stuff than those in 1 and 2, but they only happen once every 3 months. This means that within the game's projected 2-year lifespan, there are only 8 opportunities for new content, 
three of which have already gone by. This change was made to support the game's new season system. It works really well for the catalogs and leaderboards, but only having new content be added at the beginning of a season is super dumb. Dropping everything at the start of a season will just kill all interest in it in a week or two, and no amount of events or mid-season balance patches can change that. It is possible to have a season system while still frequently providing new content. I mean, Fortnite does it, and it's been arguably the most popular online shooter for the past few years. The new content we get isn't even anything worth waiting three months for either. Either. The new season gave us less kits than two would have given on average in a three month period, and it gave us 25 pieces of gear. 20 f***ing <laughs> Five. For the kind of update we get once every three months, that is just inexcusable. We are 10 months into the game's life, and only around half the game's weapons have gotten second kits, many of which are shooters. This means many weapons are to go an entire year without getting a second kit. The Stringer class, the big new weapon class advertised on the cover art, is going to have only had two weapons within the game's first year. And let's not forget that the gold dynamo roller has been featured in the first trailer, promotional material, and in the game's files, yet it's still not usable in-game. I don't even like the dynamo roller, but come on Nintendo, what are you waiting for? It's not like weapon kits even take that long to make, all you need to do is reskin a weapon and give it a new sub and special, which is something a modder could do in under half an hour. You know how everyone likes to make fun of Mojang for their laziness with Minecraft updates? Here, it's just as pathetic, if not more. Everything else we get in the updates is mostly stuff that should have been in the game at launch, and only a small fraction of actually helpful additions. If I spend $80 on a game, I shouldn't have to wait a year for it to reach its full potential so I can properly enjoy it. With so many glaring problems, the devs should really take some action to fix them. Unfortunately, the chances of that happening are slim, because... If you follow me on Twitter, god forbid, you may have noticed that I have not exactly been kind to this game's developers, particularly series producer Hisashi Nishimiya. I know this sounds petty as hell, and it honestly kind of is, but can you really blame me? We've already gone over so many stupid decisions they made, from the stale maps to the slow updates. These issues haven't even divided the community like a turning point for a franchise normally would. Nearly everyone in the community agrees that this game is flawed as hell and needs fixing. It's been 10 months, and how have the devs responded thus far? Well, The matchmaking is still non-existent. Brellas, Line Marker, and Ink Back are still bottom tier. The devs keep making the most bizarre balance changes imaginable, as opposed to ones that would actually benefit the game. And of course, the maps. It's been nearly a year, and they're still as underdeveloped as they were at launch. The three new maps added post-launch all share the same base shape. There has yet to be a single major map overhaul, despite how much people have been clamoring for them. The fresh season patch notes initially made it seem like they were addressing the problems, only for the changes to just be a bunch of signs and poles to block long-range attacks, which fix 10% of the map's problems at best. Since there are three-month periods in between updates, there is a lot of build-up and anticipation for fixes, only for the players to be met with disappointment after disappointment. Such baffling changes and decisions would normally divide the community, but in this case, barring the Splatfest debate, pretty much everyone in the community agrees that these are massive problems that need fixing, aside from the little Timmies who have no idea what's going on. While I am glad the Splatoon community hasn't gone the way of the Paper Mario fandom, it frustrates me seeing the devs barely respond to the feedback despite it being unanimous. As a matter of fact, they did bring up the issue with the maps in a Famitsu interview, and it was a non-answer explaining a basic game design principle which the current maps don't even follow. Thankfully, the devs haven't completely ignored fan complaints if the tricolor rework and the Brella bug fixes are anything to go by. But if you spend any more than a minute online, you will notice that a lot of people are very vocally upset about the map design and other things, which means that you should maybe take some goddamn action. I swear, this game would probably be within the top 5 online shooters of all time if the devs weren't so stupid. If they had any brain cells, we would have gotten more than a few problems addressed by now. Unfortunately, we live in the bad timeline, where people would rather whine about beer cans than stop the world from burning up. <sighs> As I said, we are 10 months into this game's life, and the fact that so many issues haven't been addressed is worrying. But we're still less than halfway through the game's life, so there's still hope. Final Fantasy XIV and Star Wars Battlefront II both had disastrous launches, yet they still picked up and became the beloved online behemoths they are today. If those games can improve, Splatoon 3 can too. But if you ask me, the chance of that happening is honestly not that high. After all, the Splatoon series is made by the same department at Nintendo as Animal Crossing. That series' latest installment 
development, New Horizons, launched with less content and charm than the rest of the series, or so I've heard, received new content at a snail's pace and dropped support far earlier than initially planned. It seems like some of the carelessness from that game has transferred over to Splatoon 3. Honestly, if this game's update cycle ends early as well, I wouldn't be surprised. I get that Nogami wants to avoid crunch as much as possible, and good on him for being against it, but that doesn't excuse all the stupidity and ignorance regarding Splatoon 3 and its development. If I spend $80 on a game, I should expect a big, complete game worth the effort rather than a half-baked product that may or may not get better over time. I know I kinda sound like I hate this game, but that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm only so hard on this game because I love it and I want it to be the best game it could possibly be. Who knows, if the devs do respond to the complaints and the game improves because of it, I might make a much more positive video on this game in the future. After all, the Splatoon devs aren't really the dumbest on the planet. I mean, come on, look at the Overwatch devs. But it's really hard to stay optimistic about this game's future when the devs keep making dumb choice after dumb choice, so I'm sadly gonna have to keep my expectations low. After all, as Zendaya once said, keep your expectations low and you'll never be disappointed. Well, in that case, I can't wait for Side Order to just be a straight line where you press one button and win, with a terrible story that completely butchers Pearl's and Marina's characters. Woo! I love Nogami!